Hi, and welcome to our webinar, Enterprise AI, The Ugly. Will Enterprise AI Steal Your Job? This is the fourth and final episode in our Enterprise AI Research Study Series. You can see the earlier episodes using the links in the attachments section of the control panel that you're watching this through. I'm John Burke, the Murdy's CTO, and with me today is, <clears throat> excuse me, Jerry Murphy, <clears throat> who is not coughing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I choke everybody up. That's that's okay. Very <laughs> um, typical reaction. <laughs> like to encourage everybody to submit any questions that they have along the way using the Q&A panel on the right. It's the question mark. And to check out the attachments for ways to connect with us. We will... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, spend just a little time introducing ourselves before we move into the, the subject at hand, Enterprise AI, our research study. Um, Nemertes is a research and strategic advisory company that is focused on uncovering uh, best practices and success practices that really help uh, businesses get the most value out of their deployment of emerging technologies. We do research with enterprises on how they're using technology uh, across a broad uh, swath of spaces, most recently enterprise artificial intelligence. And this is the results data of that research study that we're gonna be walking through the, the last part of today. Uh, for the study, we spoke with uh, 28 uh, enterprise IT professionals at, uh, or, or sorry, from uh, over eight uh, industries. Uh, about seven of the participants were financial services firms uh, so we have a, a good rich vein of data there that actually uh, one of our colleagues will be presenting on uh, tomorrow for the WSTA. Um, the median employee count of the companies that we spoke to is about 23,000 people and the median annual revenue 7.8 billion. So uh, half the company's smaller than that, half the company's larger than that. And uh, the data that we got has been interesting all along. If you haven't seen the earlier episodes in the series, please by all, all means check them out. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Jerry to walk through the uh, the last episode of our series here. Hey, thanks, John. So when you look at it, you know, one of the questions is, right, uh, is my job going away? Where's any liability for any of this AI stuff going? And where's the money coming from? This is kind of the, sort of the things I ask myself. And it's just interesting when you look at the participants' observation, a, a couple of them, that I want to sort of highlight here is that sort of in the top left here, right? You know, people have been not sure, you, you know, whether people are going to be replaced with headcount. Um, we're not really sure people thought so, but maybe not. Um, and also the bottom left, right? You know, right now it's like the wild west when you look at AI. Now, when I'm saying this, I would I'll caveat this by to, to a lot of what people are talking about here is the generative artificial intelligence. So uh, we've had artificial intelligence around, if you think about things like machine learning, automation, we've had a lot of that around for a long time. But but really recently we've seen this sort of versioning of auto generation along the lines of chat GPT, Dolly, where, where I literally can create things. Um, and this is where people are all over the map in terms of what's going on and we're just initially starting to see how we're using it and the regulations are far from set in terms of you know how do you regulate this is the information being gathered from legal sources is the information that we're gathering full of biases um there's a lot of promise but frankly a lot of uncertainty with a lot of this stuff and i think that's kind of where people are sort of like depending on where you are they're either cautiously excited or cautiously nervous about how this uh, use of all this stuff is going to work for people. Now, uh, while there's this massive adoption rate that we're sort of seeing places in different areas, clearly, based on what I just said, is you're seeing what there isn't of is consistent policies and especially governance, right? It's not only how am I using this, but how am I controlling it? What, what am I not allowing somebody to use? What are the appropriate contexts with which I'm going to use this? And this is something that uh, I'm afraid could be really serious. Some people probably saw in the news recently, right, where 
uh, there was a lawyer who was actually using, you know, chat GPT to come up with references of previous cases that would support his um, case. And in fact, the opposing side found out that the cases he cited were literally fabricated. So not just the cases, but the courts in which they were filed. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of uncertainty. I mean, it, you know, so I mean, clearly that's illegal, but what's the context and what's it's appropriate? Where do I use it? And then how does all of the get that get enforced? And the answer in most instances is I really don't know. Right. Um, and who is it that's going to really be the AI policy police? And at first blush, you might think, well, it's clearly going to be somebody in IT, since this seems like an IT thing, or maybe it's going to be somebody within the chief risk officer. Uh, and as I've talked with people, you know, I don't know that you can conclude that because one of the things that you'll see, uh, you've seen this in our previous studies, we'll, we'll highlight here a little bit too, is um, the IT people aren't where all of the people are that are using this stuff. And matter, matter of fact, it looks to me like you've got way more than generally speaking, twice as many people in businesses that are using AI. And I don't even know that the IT department even necessarily knows that people are using this stuff. So uh, if they're pol if they're the ones in charge with policing it, you know, it's not obvious to me how they're going to actually be uh, doing this. Right. And so I don't know what the policy is. I don't know who's policing it. What are the regulations that are going to be there? What are the laws that are going to be passed? And this is another area that I think, John, we're we're going to see a lot of reactive. We don't know what the policy, we know the law is, but somebody's going to suffer some grievous uh, problem. There's going to be some multi-billion dollar uh, loss to some company. And then after the fact, you're going to have Congress saying, why there should be a law against doing X, Y, or Z. And so they'll come, but they're probably going to come as they almost always do after some big issues have already happened. Oh yeah, just uh, one or two people cooking up a good batch of chlorine scented rice made with real bleach um, and, and the lawsuits will be uh, spectacular. Absolutely. So when you look at where are these teams to manage AI, um, first off, you could say, well, 50% of the people say they have them today. Of course, the other side of that coin is 50% do not have them today. And of those, almost 25% haven't even thought about it, which to me is a little bit scary. Um, so when you look at it, uh, organizations that have, you know, uh, we say that they have them or will have them by the end of 2023. I don't know. Uh, aggressive and large companies are 30% more likely to have teams. And that's, an, I think, an important point, too, is aggressive companies have some of the teams with conservative ones don't but also interestingly highly productive organizations and the way we define that is companies who make more than a million dollars per employee um are less likely to have teams focused on ai um but they are going to be assessing these teams so you know the existence of ai teams is certainly there um People are throwing some money and initiative at this, uh, but in fact, it's not universal and, and it's a little bit counterintuitive that some of the people that you would think would be investing in this uh, are not. So, you know, it's, but in my mind, it's something that certainly needs to be considered. Um, and if, if you're not, you probably should be. Now, uh, when you look at teams managing them, uh, 62% of people are having them. And again, 27% are not evaluating or assessing or they've assessed and reject them. So uh, the teams that aren't there probably need to be uh, thinking about it uh, and that they're not. Um, what are the differences that we're seeing here? Aggressive organizations are 46% more likely. Large organizations, 87% more likely to do this, to have, have these teams um, but they're only 30% more likely to have AI teams with NIIT, which is interesting organizationally. One would think that because the technology generally comes from IT, that the IT people would be driving this. 
but uh, in the people I've talked with and, and in our study, certainly uh, you're seeing way more people in the lines of business that are are using uh, IT for th- or are using uh, generative AI specifically for uh, artificial intelligence. Another thing I, I, I've seen here, and we don't break it out here so much, but I, I've also found it somewhat industry specific too. There are some industries like media entertainment that are seeing this either of it's going to be absolutely critical. I've seen two different things. It's either absolutely critical that we get there because this is the key to our future is embracing this stuff. But of course, some people are like, this is affecting a lot of jobs in content creation. If I got a bunch of people I'm paying to generate scripts for movies and all of a sudden the AI is going to do it, uh, I think that's a lot of what these recent um, strikes have been about in uh, in Hollywood. And uh, so on the one hand, it's like, is is it key to me being effective or is it something that's going to seriously affect my employment? And the answer may be uh, it's a little bit of both. So when you look at AI teams within administrative groups, um, we don't see them as much um, on generally administrative departments like HR, finance, legal. Um, and some of those areas would probably be useful for people to co- to consider using them, uh, but we're not seeing them as much. And only 16% of organizations really have them. And as you can see uh, from our findings, it's, it's – uh, pretty rare that we're seeing them. And I think probably people do need to uh, consider uh, using them. Uh, They're not perceiving the need. um, And I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. I think there's a lot of value there. It has to be a lot more mature than it is now, but there clearly are benefits there. Imagine, for example, if you're an HR person and you want to know what is an employment, uh, what do the laws say in state a b or c or country x y and z about you know what we can do for hiring people and in my mind you know uh, ai tools can be very effective in pulling that information with the caveat that the information it's pulling is accurate but it could actually help you quite a bit i was just reviewing some uh, case study stuff for um telecoms and it occurred to me that that would be another slam dunk for a lot of finance departments is bill review yeah where you have data i mean from my perspective there's a bunch of data out there it's tough to sift through it ai can help you sift through the data so the good news is if i got a bunch of data out there can help me sift through it the caveat is is the data accurate is the data comprehensive is the data does the data contain biases? And those are the things that you have to be concerned about. But if you do have data and it, and it is good and useful information, you know, AI can, can really help you quite a bit for those kind of things. So people should be looking at it. Um, so what are the key findings for organizing, organizing for AI? Um, IT really is playing catch up here. You're really seeing the use of, and again, generative AI, really being led far more by the business units uh, than than uh, IT. So IT really needs to look at that and, and do something about that. Um, aggressive and large organizations are likely to throw people at the AI initiative, productive ones not. And I think also one of the reasons maybe productive don't, if, if you look at our definition of productive as being high revenue per employee, sometimes that might also see the reason I got a lot of revenue per employee is because I'm not spending a lot of money. So sometimes those highly efficient are efficient from a not spending a bunch of money on stuff perspective, um, which could be another reason why you're seeing uh, less investment there. Um, When you look across the spectrum, uh, as we said, not enough in some of these admin functions that really probably could use it because if you use, again, if used properly, actually can provide you a lot of benefits that maybe they're not uh, taking advantage of uh, today. Um, So if the line of business is considered uh, using this and they're using it effectively, uh, other people probably could do it as well. And and maybe IT can help in there more than they have been in the past. Now, what's the impact on the headcount? And this is where I think our our headline is a little misleading, right? When like, is, is I AI after our jobs? 
And the answer is, you know, uh, I don't know that it is, right? Um, when you're looking at, at the numbers here, um, one of the things that you can see here is that uh, large companies certainly have more teams on this. But the other thing we see is that um, the, the lines of business actually tend to have more IT people uh, than or are more people doing AI than, than the IT departments themselves have. Um, you see financial services tend to be well represented, highly productive, less so. And I think for some of the reasons uh, that we talked about before. When you look at growth in AI uh, from employees, uh, highly productive um, has more growth in some of these areas compared to uh, all the others. Um, organizations are starting to ramp up their their IT, um, but what I'm what I've seen when I interviewed people is that the line of business there seems to be a lot of growth and the continued use there, but in IT it's not growing at quite the same rate as it's growing in the lines of business. Uh, and as you can see here, the highest growth rates are in conservative organizations where you're seeing 100% growth rates year over year, large is 75% and highly productive organizations uh, at 50. So uh, there is growth, people are seeing it across the board, but the rates of growth seem to change a bit depending on the nature of your companies. Um, outside of IT, as you can see here, the numbers are generally larger. And depending on where you are an institution, that number could be uh, considerably larger. But the consistent finding across the board, the way I'm reading this is any, you know, the lines of business tend to be actually doing more of the actual use of generative AI than, than IT is themselves. Uh, median anticipated growth in AI outside IT, 50-50. Uh, and then as you go out, it starts to smooth down. It'll be interesting, John. I almost wonder uh, when, not if, when we have some AI, generative AI crisis, it'll be interesting to see. I kind of predict that you might see some kind of retrenchment there. We're seeing consistent growth. I think we're still in the hype cycle of this. I think once we get some uh-ohs going on with the excessive use, reliance on things that have not been uh, properly curated, I think you'll actually see some industry-wide retrenchment here. Um, I, I suspect, too, also uh, the same thing uh, due also to um, failure to realize uh, a recognizable return on the investment of all those bodies. So we, you'll see some uh, shrink and down. This is something we haven't talked about, but I think in the line with that, John, is cost, right? Because a lot of this generative AI is kind of free. But when you look at it, you know, the cost of one of these NVIDIA blades is like, what, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000? These things are not cheap. And if you look at the cost of that, the cost of database, the cost of licensing, um, I think when people go from the catnip of, wow, this seems really cool to now I'm paying for it per seat on a monthly basis. And now I've got to have all of the CPU processing in order to do this myself, as a lot of companies are going to require for privacy reasons of the data. Uh, I think I think we're at the tip of the iceberg and actually even realizing what the costs to companies are of all of the, uh, not just the people, but, but the actual equipment and software licensing that you're going to have to have. Uh, and I think people are going to go, holy moly, uh, just like they've done with virtualization, right? Cloud computing is going to be our savior. And then it's like, you know, it looks like it's going to be cheaper. In reality, it's not. I think the same thing's going to happen here. Yep. I suspect you're right. Yeah. So as we said, you've got decent growth rates, higher outside as opposed to uh, within. Um but I think uh, the types of organizations, it is also going to change. Um, but I think uh, there's going to be some surprises there when we start having problems that that 
the research isn't seeing that, but I'm just, I, I my gut is telling me you're going to actually start seeing some problems with that. Um, and, and it's not necessarily going to be growing to the moon forever. I think it's going to taper off more than, than people are thinking. Uh, I think the uh, big deal nature of it, the idea that it is going to be radically transformative um, is getting people to overinvest up front, not because it's not going to be, I think they're overinvesting. And I think that not because I don't think it's going to be radically transformative. I think they're just overreacting based on their underreaction in previous generations of transformative technological change. Yeah. You know, they, they undersold the promise of other things and wound up playing catch up. Now they're trying to be ahead of it. Um, yeah. It'll balance out. Now, when you look at is AI coming for your jobs, I think the the answer to this is almost resoundingly no. Now, I think there are some lower administrative types of tasks that AI is going to replace. But in order for it to be effective, what you're going to find, and we found this in technology over the last 150 years, right? Every time you have technology that's coming to replace our jobs, whether it's the assembly line for automotive manufacturing or computers and now AI, yes, there is a category of jobs it's going to replace lower skilled workers for. But what you're going to find, and we found this pretty consistently in our, our research, is that you know, you're going to need people that are going to have to govern and control what AI is doing. And also, there's going to be a whole other set of jobs that it's going to create that didn't previously exist, just as happened with any time you use new technology. So uh, I think those two things are really, in some sense, uh, hopeful, right? That, that if we use it correctly, it can actually generate uh, more jobs for us, not, not really... Uh, uh, get rid of them. Interestingly, smaller organizations seem to be more bullish on this than larger ones. Uh, I don't know if that's because they don't know or if it's just because they're understaffed that they're actually happy to have something in there to help them with some of their uh, staffing shortages. Um, uh, certainly no immediate job loss is one of the things we're saying there. All the stuff about IT going to take our jobs. I think about the South Park episode where people come from the future and come over and they're getting our jobs. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, it really doesn't seem like uh, that's going to happen. Now, if you're somebody who's used to punching in and doing some very routine activity, yeah, I would be concerned if I'm doing something that, that seems to be very rote and routine. Yeah, that job might be a, at risk. But if you have got value add things that are going to be happening, uh, those things are, are not uh, going to be going away. And the other takeaway here is really AI is bigger than IT. We're, we're seeing this right now with the businesses. It's really something that's not just about making IT more efficient, but it's potentially transforming your business, getting you into other areas that you're gonna that you're gonna have to be into, um, which actually is, is pretty hopeful. Uh, at the same token, while it's while it's hopeful, uh, I think the real bug boom gotcha is going to be on the governance side, right? We're 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 finding that um, there isn't a lot of governance there, and our fear is that there needs to be governance there uh, if you want to prevent some of these issues there. So uh, I think you need to look at establishing governance and policies around things like digital ethics, because that's going to be really important. And that's going to be something that's going to bite you if you're you're not thinking about it. How is it that we're going to enforce policies within the line of business, especially if the line of business is driving it and, and high T hasn't been involved? Who is it that's responsible for setting the policies? Who's responsible uh, for enforcing that? You know, it kind of makes sense to think about that being, say, within... IT, big data, and analytics, right? Because a lot of this uh, generative AI is done because I'm pulling, calling information from large data sources. So it might make sense for looking at the governance uh, on things like not just is it valid or invalid, but is does the data have bias? Um, 
you know, who's going to govern that and, and how are we going to control the quality of that stuff? Um, and for compliance, are we are we generating information that's violating any of our corporate policies or any of our privacy policies? Are we inadvertently sharing customer information that that we're not aware of because these things are just generating off of data that they got from, you know, if I'm smart, I know where it's coming from because I'm doing it directly. But if it's coming from publicly generated public data, I would really have a big uh, warning flag on that. You know, who is it that develops these AI offerings for the uh, other groups? You know, uh, do I standardize on this stuff? Uh, our feeling is you don't really want to standardize. It's easy to sit there and say open AI is going to have all this stuff. But just like any new technologies, you're going to have a bunch of different vendors there. So our recommendation would be instead of just saying I'm going to double down on one technology, you know, anything that you do, keep it with standards interfaces, so that as new technologies come along, you have the ability to move where you're getting information or how you're sharing information with other types of technology uh, that are gonna come along. Um, we also encourage people to really look at using AI for some of these administrative areas, such as legal and HR, because we think those are areas that can actually benefit from the ability to cull through a bunch of your data there. As you change a policy, how does that policy affect our existing employees um, or, or existing clients? That's something that could be uh, really helpful there. Um, and if you don't have governance, we really think you have to put that in place because I think that's really the thing that's really going to bite people that are unaware of it. We're so excited about using this technology. And then all of a sudden you're going to realize it's bad information, not factual information, information that comes from clients that we're not supposed to share, et cetera, et cetera. So look at my thumbs up there. So <laughs> make sure you take all that into consideration. So that's for me then. Thanks, yeah. Jerry. Um, um, sure thing. Before, uh, before we go to Q&A, if anybody has questions for us, um, I want to draw everybody's attention to a few things, uh, starting with the attachments tab. If you go in there, you'll see links to connect to us on LinkedIn to register for upcoming Bright Talk sessions, which will not be part of this series. We're done with this series, but there's always more coming. Uh, and to look at uh, previous episodes, the the good and the bad, uh, and the maturity model episode uh, from this series. So please do visit the channel and uh, also visit us in our community. We have for enterprise IT professionals. A private online community that is, you know, just us chickens. Uh, fill out a short application on our website, uh, and you can join the community and uh, associate with like-minded individuals who will understand your jokes and uh, have useful advice for you when you you come up with uh, either technological or uh, process or administrative questions uh, that other IT folks would get. Uh, and with that. We will give one last chance for questions and uh, Jerry and I will do our level best to answer them if they come up, but I don't see any popping up in the panel here. So uh, I will instead say, thanks. The replay of this session should be up on our channel shortly. Uh, if you found the session valuable, please share uh, the link to it with your colleagues and please take a moment to rate the webinar. It helps us shape our content going forward. Thanks very much for joining us today. And we look forward to having you join us again soon. Uh, Jerry, you later. Take care. Bye, all.